welcome another episode, Dr. James Beckett's Sports Card Insights. And uh, let me thank the sponsors before we get started. And uh, don't fast forward through this part because sponsors are important to uh, to uh, all shows. But uh, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, COMC.com, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Tops, Panini, and Upper Deck. All great sponsors. Hope you'll patronize them. And uh, I'm here with Jeff Wilson, Sports Card Investors. I hope you'll patronize Jeff's sponsors as well <laughs> and, and, and check out Jeff's show. I'm a, uh, I'm a fan. I'm a subscriber. I listen faithfully and uh, enjoy what you're doing, Jeff. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Tell us about how you got started and what gave you, I know what gave me the audacity to <laughs> do a podcast, but what, what, just tell us about some of your origin story. Yeah, well, I was a huge car collector when I was a kid, as are, I'm sure, many of the listeners out there today. Uh, my first job ever actually was in a baseball card store when I was 14 years old. All right. uh, I was you know, so into baseball cards and I got a job at a baseball card store I got fired my very first day. It was the, it was, I was absolutely devastated. It was, because it was my dream job. Um, I got fired because I had a, um, I, I was 14. I had never worked a job before, had no experience. And these two like 18 year old kids came into the store and I was just in the store by myself. And one of them came up to the counter and started pe- peppering me with questions and said, show me that card, show me that card, show me that card, show me that card, show me that card. The other one went around and yeah. threw stuff in his backpack That's and then classic. they walked out of the store. I had oh. no idea. I totally ignorant at 14 years old that that could even happen. Yeah. Had no idea it happened until the owner came back and realized stuff was missing. And, uh, unfortunately that was my one and only day working in a baseball card store, but it did not change my absolute love for baseball cards and love for the hobby. Um, and so I, I had that love when I was a kid, but then when I went off to college and you know, the whole thing, I, I totally lost touch with the hobby for many, many years and got brought back into it last year. Well, actually, I guess two years ago now, since we're now in 2020. Um, by my son, who at the time was seven and had just spent some time with my mom, his grandmother. And she, as part of his time with her, she bought him some football cards yeah. and he brought them home and we opened them together and we looked at them. And I, I said, this is funny because I, in my attic, I have, you know, boxes of tens yeah. of thousands of football cards from the, which I have not cracked open in 30 years. And, uh, that started it and that rekindled my interest and we started buying cards together. And then I, and then I quickly began to realize how much different, the production of the cards is today and so many different aspects of the hobby, much, much different than they were when I was, uh, you know, collecting in the eighties and the early nineties. Okay. Well, it's, um, I want, you know, one of the fun things about doing this in person, cause we're across the table from each other rather than over the phone or remotely is that we can work off each other, mm-hmm. what we're saying, but I, I've got to respond to your, your unjust firing <laughs> that your that your boss, the owner of the shop, left put a a fourteen year old with with minimal or no training in charge. Uh, I just have to disclose though that that's happened to me. I didn't get fired because it was my stuff, but the variation on that game is that's happened for for decades. Yeah. But back in the day when I was a dealer, but my variation of the story was more insidious, and they they didn't dislike me. These were, but it was three guys. Mm-hmm. And so it was one guy peppering me with questions. One guy was a blocker and the other guy was at one end of the table, mm. you know, palming Putting all the stuff, stuff in, yeah. in, into the bag. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they all three left. Yep. And, uh, and it was their 49 Bowman high numbers, which even in those days were valuable. Yeah. Very valuable. So they were not random. They knew, yeah. they, they knew what to take. And yeah. it was at the one end of the table. And uh, of course, I don't do shows anymore, but it's not because of that. Mm. But it was, um, it's unfortunate that uh, that there's people out. There's so many ways to make an honest buck in this yes. industry. Why do you have to stoop Correct. to that? And so what you've done in your podcast is help people see how they can make an honest buck. So you've taken that tragedy and turned it into a, into a positive result. That's what I tried to do. And I, I tried to especially appeal to newer people who are getting into the hobby right now, um, because there are... So many people who are flooding in right now who are in, they have that same rekindled interest than I did. But what they find is that the hobby is pretty complex now. Absolutely. You know? and there's a lot to it. And if you're, if you're coming in and you're looking to buy the right cards and, and maybe make a few dollars along the way, you got to be smart and savvy about how you approach things. I, uh, I'm going to do an episode about kind of, uh, and I'm not going to call it the matrix, but basically there's, if you haven't been in the hobby for a very long time, you have to have a small matrix of players yes. and cards that you're interested in. Yes. And there's a hierarchy of cards and you're 
a lot of your focus on in your podcast is on the tip of the pyramid, you know, mm-hmm. the kind of the the whatever that would be, the upper left corner of the matrix or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But your your key players and their key cards, correct? Okay. But a lot of the health of the hobby is in the long tail. Mm-hmm. The problem is you can't learn about the long tail except by experiencing it. I think for decades, mm-hmm. unless you have an outrageous photographic memory, sure, you can only know it. So you focused on. The, the key players mm-hmm. that are going to be in the public eye and their key cards. That is correct. And I, intent- I intentionally do that because I think it makes it more consumable. Because uh, as time goes by, again, what, as yeah. I draw this out, this concept, that matrix can expand. It yes. can move out. I can, I can look at more Luca cards yeah. than just his rookie cards. Yeah. I can expand that or I can look at Trey Young and, and Zion and other, I can move down to other players, even though I may have a hierarchy there. Um, yeah. And I want to play with the definition of the word key cards a little bit because, um, I, I th- you know, some people define key cards as the most possible valuable player. Yeah. So like a key card for Luca might be his national treasures RPA. I try to focus on what card has the highest transaction volume. Right. That's how I define key cards. So when I'm talking about, for example, basketball, I'm most often talking about prism because the right. prism cards, the prism base and the prism silver are, have the highest transaction volume out of all cards. And so I like to focus on the really high transaction volume cards because those are the ones that are easier for people to find, for Establish people to the price, yeah. for, for, the, for the market to be established. Yeah. Again, that's, that's, that's a very wise strategy, mm-hmm. especially for someone coming in because they can they can get a handle on that. Right. As as you move out to the more obscure yep. cards, uh, you can't just when you see something, you know, if it's online, I guess you can say, well, I'm gonna check, I'm gonna I'm gonna go research this. But if you're in a show, yep. you know, you've got to say, hey, this looks like a good deal, or I'm sure this is a good deal. Mm-hmm. This is the one I want. And so again, if it's too obscure, the newer collector yep. that has money but not as much knowledge, yep. it's better to to focus, kind of have a body of knowledge that you can really get a handle on. Yep. So I think you're encouraging people in the right way, and it's going to give them a chance to have mostly a positive experience, maybe limited because they only have this bit of knowledge. But within that set of knowledge, they can do great, right? Which I think is what you're, you're Absolutely. encouraging. Absolutely. And when I I, I heard you know, one of your previous podcasts where you you know talked about some of the things on my top twenty list right. of things that new collectors need to know. I, some of the things you pointed out, I think very correctly. So was in some cases I said you know like absolutely buy graded cards, absolutely negotiate, absolutely do this, absolutely that. And you made some points of like, well, that's not always the case. Almost always. And I would agree, yeah. but the for the newer collector, by thinking a little bit more in terms of absolutes, it, it puts them in that quadrant that you're describing. It boxes it in and it makes it more, uh, it makes it easier for them to process. I think as somebody gets more experienced as a collector or an investor, then they can bend those rules a bit. You know, then, oh, well, you don't always have to buy graded cards because right. you can you can evaluate a raw card yourself and pretty quickly ascertain if that's going to grade as a gem mint or not. Or, you know, you don't always have to, uh, you know, do some of the other things on the list because you don't always have to buy a rookie card, for example, was one of the things you pointed out, because sometimes second year cards can actually hold a tremendous amount of value. Well, points well taken. And again, I think that it's uh, important to note that, that you're, you have a, uh, a focus on a, on a kind of a demographic. These are people getting, I mean, I think my perception mm-hmm. is there's some people out there that have spending money. Mm-hmm. They're, they're people that are, that when they were collectors as a kid, they're buying fifty cent dollar, two dollar packs. Now packs are a lot more, but they have the money for it, and uh, we, you really don't want them to have a bad experience. Right. And so, you know, I make a joke about buy low and sell high, mm-hmm. but you don't want them to buy high and sell low right. and get burned. Correct. And and they don't. The, the perception of value, like I said, is it's. I have a perception of value from doing price guides, from being in the industry and the hobby for a long time, but you can't get that overnight. Right. And so I think you're trying to protect people. Okay. So. Tell us about your your secular career, your your daytime, sure. your investing in tech companies. Yeah, what is that? Is that is that uh, you know for me, my daytime job carried over into the wee hours of the night. Yeah. And so, uh, to what extent is that uh, totally active or partially passive? Or I mean, what? What's... No, it's totally active. Uh, sports card investor is what is carrying over into the wee hours of the night. Um, that's the when I'm doing the shows and the podcasts, and uh, soon I'm I'm coming out with a membership program and premium content right. and all this stuff. Um, that's my nights and weekends. So but it's I mean, pretty okay, busy. But I mean, your daytime, but, are, you, are yes. you running companies, investing in companies, I, I, yeah. being on boards of companies, private equity, yep. venture capital, angel? What, what, what kind of aspect are you bringing to that? Sure. Yeah. So I, um, so my, my main company is a company called 352. It's an, in, in, it's an innovation and growth firm. Uh, we're a kind of a bit consultancy, a bit agency. Hmm. So we work with, IDEO? um, hmm? like an idea. Actually, very similar to IDEO. Hmm. In fact, we do a lot of that same type of work, early stage product design, cool. market research, understanding the customer, uh, crafting new products, new revenue streams for companies. That's the exact type of work we do. And I told you um, I do that too. 
Yeah, I on, just do it for, for free. On a, on a, right, for free on a consulting basis. Okay. Yeah, because uh, but because I do it for free, right. I'm always looking for other people to to hand off to. Yep. So I'll keep that in mind, yeah. uh, Jeff. That's please do. But you're in Atlanta. Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta. Um, so my so three five two six. We have, I have sixty full time employees. Um, and uh, we have three offices: Atlanta, uh, where I'm based, and then we have two offices in Florida, Tampa and Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I started the company in Gainesville, Florida. So I've actually started that company about 20 years ago, hmm. uh, coming out of the University of Florida. Um, and that's why we saw a number of people in Gainesville because I lived there for many gotcha. years growing the company and then moved to Atlanta about six years ago uh, to grow our Atlanta presence. And, and uh, you know, uh, have you been asked by the card companies to give them any kind of uh, feedback in terms of your company's expertise? Um, I've offered some feedback unsolicited. <laughs> See, now you, you could yeah, actually, Jeff, you could probably do the pro bono. You can copy me. I've not been hired. That- I've not been hired by any of them yet, but I do. Um, I, I actually have had conversations with a couple of them about, you know, their digital presence. Uh, there's, there's, yeah. there's room for improvement, yes. um, with, with what, you know, some of the card companies and, and, you know, uh, uh, dealers and that type of thing are doing online. Um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement and a lot of opportunity now because, you know, so much is moving that direction. It has to. Yeah. It has to. And, uh, you know, I think there'll always be cardboard or other kinds of physical stuff, but there's going to be more and more virtual and there more is. and more stuff going on. That's, that's just, uh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, I've run 352 for about 20 years and then I, uh, along the way started founding and investing in some other startups as well. And so that's, I do a lot of that work now as well. I, I, uh, mentor, uh, at the Atlanta Tech Village, which is the big okay. tech incubator in Atlanta. Hmm. Um, I've mentored at Techstars and some of the other startup programs. And then all through that, find companies who I think are really intriguing or really interesting and, and invest in them and then yeah. help the founders, you know, kind of counsel the founders, you know, through the process of growing a company. Um, and I'm interested, I, I'm actually talking to a handful of people who are startup founders who are focused on the sports card space. And I, I can tell you that I think there's going to be some really interesting new players coming into the space. Um, in some cases, some really well established tech founders from other who have founded very large, uh, reputable, you know, successful startups and, and are now actually looking to the sports card space for their next startup. Um, so I've heard some really interesting pitches recently. We are out of time, but you are obviously expert at baiting the hook. I'm going to have you come back. But I, I do note that uh, in your uh, 352 approach of trying to help these uh, organizations in, in your consulting aspect, I have, when people come to me and they say, I say, well, I'll be happy to meet with you. And they say, no, I can't meet with you because I'm not sure what questions to ask. I don't have it all figured out. And I say, if you had it all figured out, I, I wouldn't be interested in meeting with you. <laughs> the whole point of it is the discovery and having mm-hmm. somebody that's that's not too close to it, but can bring some other energy or other perspectives to it. So we're doing some similar things and uh, enjoyed uh, visiting with you today. Jeff, we'll be back again with another episode tomorrow. And I promise to have Jeff back uh, soon as well. So thanks, listeners. Uh, again, we uh, appreciate your support and we'll be back uh, again tomorrow. Thanks. Bye. Listo.